All right, let me close out my YouTube. Let me close out ViewPure. Close out that one. And let's pull up, not Google site, that's the next one. Is it? This is it. Okay. Back to Zoom. Okay. Screen share. All right. So if you're here now, sorry, it's 11.04. Um, you are here to learn about Screencastify or to refresh your memory or to see it in a new light because <laughs> it maybe matters more. Um, if anyone has suggestions or ideas along the way, I know that there are many of you that have been using it. So this is not a everything Susie knows. If, it, if you guys have anything to share, then please do because I think that that's awesome that I'm not the only one sharing. So we are going over Screencastify, which is a tool that allows you to record your screen, which shows the movements on your screen, or it allows you to record your face, or you can do both at the same time. So we will go through some of that. And for me, using Screencastify as a student or as a teacher is an incredible way to make thinking visible. And when you're able to see and hear what a student is thinking, it's incredibly powerful as a teacher because that enables you to reach their needs a lot easier. And so teaching students how to use Screencastify, because even students have this tool all the way down to the little ones, I think will be a huge part of what you'll need to do during this um, well, during this future, no matter how long it lasts, because I think that making thinking visible isn't something that will ever go away. Uh, the, the biggest proponent of the whole idea who's done the most research is John Hattie. I have a wicked edu crush on John Hattie. I think that he's incredibly smart and he's been doing a lot of work actually with his research when it comes to remote or hybrid or personalized learning during this pandemic. So it's not like he's just rested on his laurels and said, yeah, I'm awesome. He's like, now let's figure out how what I know can help during these crazy times. So I'm going to share a John Hattie video. I believe it's a little longer than my less than four minute limit, but, um, but it's John Hattie. So, oh, wait a minute. I'm not going to do the whole thing. When you see 1640 show up at the bottom, don't panic. I'm going to stop it. I just have to remember where. <laughs> I should have done the time thing. I don't know if there's noise yet. There it is. Given what you often hear in the media from politicians and often from any parents, it can't be that bad out there in classroom land. Certainly if I ask you to think about the teachers that had a positive, profound effect on you. Can you think of them? For me, it was Mr. Tomlinson, it was Mr. O'Neill, it was Rod McDonald. And if you actually look at what those people, what the attributes of those, those teachers were, it's often because they had a passion that they wanted you to share about what they loved the most. Well, sometimes it was because they saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself. Folks, the fact that you can think of some of those teachers, there is expertise out there in our business. There is a lot of that kind of expertise that's going out. But at the moment, our politicians, our voters are saying, we have a problem. We have to fix those teachers. We have to come up with teacher-proof teacher ways so kids can learn. We have to find ways in which we can use carrots and sticks and performance pay and all these kind of things. Well, in one sense, the focus on teachers is right. Certainly, the work I've been doing, many others, is that the biggest source of variance in our business that we have control over are the teachers. On the other hand, we have to be very careful that we don't misuse that information and then focus on individual teachers as if the system is bad, they need to be fixed. And my talk today is about identifying, the need to identify their expertise, the need to acknowledge that it's out there, the need to esteem and privilege it, and the need to certainly, 
find out and understand that notion of expertise. We have a strange profession, and that unlike many other professions like medicine, engineering, and painting and paper hanging, in our profession, when people first start off, we expect them to be experts. The first year teacher, actually they expect to be rated outstanding in their first year. And in many ways, we see them as similar to 20-year-old veterans. If you look at other professions, like medicine, they start with the registration years. They have practices. They call it the practice of medicine. Painters and paper hangers, they go through an apprenticeship. And they have a series of steps before they get there. And I think that's the kind of thing that we need to think about in our profession. Now, certainly what I've been doing is trying to say, can we take all the studies that we know of in our business, and certainly there are many, and see what's up this end in terms of what influences student achievement? What's the zero things? What makes not, no difference at all? And what things decrease achievement? And what I've been doing for the last 25 years is screwing it away and collecting data. I have close to a quarter of a billion students in the database to try and say, if I could take all the influences from the home, from the family, from the principal, from the schools, from the finance, from the policies, from the curriculum, from the teacher, from the strategies, I've got them all. And I turn them all around. And I say, well, what's the effect? When I get a distribution like this, now you can see here the zero point, the red zone. This is the kind of influences which negatively affect achievement. Now here's the good news. There's not much we do to kids that harm them. <laughs> 95 to 98% of things that we do in the name of enhancing achievement does enhance achievement. All you need to enhance achievement is a pulse. And so when politicians and parents and everyone gets up and says, we know how to fix schools, they're right if they say they can improve achievement, because everybody can. And that's one of our problems of our profession, is we have lowered the base so far to say, can we improve achievement? The teacher who comes and says, look, this is the performance of the kids at the start of the year, this is their performance of the la later at the end of the year. To me, they're criminal. We need to get rid of those teachers, because everybody can do it. But obviously you can see this average which I want to talk about today, this 0.4. Now, the number's not critical, the relativity is. Because what I want to find out is, what are the common story about what's up there in that green zone compared to what's in that yellow zone? And I'm sure every one of you here that's listening and watching who has a child in the school, if I said to you, do you want your child in the school of a teacher that has a systematic impact in the green zone or the yellow zone, it's easy. Yeah? All right. So let's start and look at some of the effects. And I want to start with looking at structural things. And I'm going to suggest to you that some of the, many of the things on this list dominate our debates about education. We have to give more money. We have to fix the class size. We have to do ability grouping. We have to come up with different kinds of schools and charter schools, yeah? So what do you think the effect of those are? Do you think they're going to be above the 0.4 or below the 0.4? I've got 200 different things, so where would they rank? Well, I can't find a single structural effect that's greater than 0.4. The majority of things that we debate in education don't matter much. And I say we because I include teachers in that along with the rest of us. The structural things, yeah, we need to get them right. But in terms of the hierarchy of this business, nah. So what about these ones? What about some attributes of the students? We all know that if only schools had the right students, life would be easy. <laughs> so you can see some of the attributes up there. So what do you think their effects are? Greater than 0.4 or less than 0.4? Does it matter who the kids are? No. What works in our business works for most kids, if not all kids. It's very far, hard to find differences. What about programs? Now, I say here deliberately deep programs, because this is what you hear all the time. You've got to have problem solving. You've got to have deep thinking. You've got to have individualized instruction. You've got to have problem-based learning. You've got to match kids' learning styles with their teaching. So what do you think? 
No. <laughs> they don't matter. And I want you to remember this because I'm going to come back to this in a moment. Technology, oh, come on. All we need to have is laptops and technology, and then things will be marvelous. Now, you know the answer, don't you? No. And the interesting thing about technology is that we've been doing these researches now for almost 40 to 50 years asking the impact of technology. And the common claim is, ah, but wait, the technology revolution, it's coming upon us, this new thing is going to come out, this new app, this new internet, whatever. Well, for the last 40 to 50 years, that effect size has not changed. Technology is the revolution that's been coming for 35 years. And it's not here yet. Okay. These are the kind of things that I would argue are the politics of distraction. The kind of things that we talk about in our business so often, which means we avoid addressing what really matters in schools. And I get so frustrated when you read the media, when you listen to the debates, everywhere, in classrooms, in staff rooms, in professional development sessions, particularly in the media, particularly amongst our politicians, they want to solve these things. Why? Well, one reason simple. You can see a lot of these things. You're not going to be able to see easily what's on the other side of the equation. And so one of my missions in this TED talk today is, can we, when we hear these kind of discussions, ask those people to go into another room so we can talk about what really matters? Let's get to the good story. Now, the first thing with those numbers, you can see, they're dramatically different. And my point is that the biggest effect in our business is expertise of the teachers. It's the teachers who work together I'll say that again. Teachers who work together, collectively, collaboratively, to understand their impact. And that's probably the biggest, single most factor in this business. That teachers and principals and systems that go into classrooms, that go into schools, that go into to, to systems, who say, my job is to understand my impact, are the ones that have the biggest effect. Not the teachers who say, my job is to cover the curriculum, my job is to get kids through the exams. It's teachers who say, I want to understand my impact. Now, it begs the moral purpose question. What is impact? And that's a really critical question. And it's Sorry. I didn't click at this time that I wanted to. I would love to let you listen to the whole thing. Have, if you've heard of John Hattie, I hope you have. I love being able to read his research. And the, the things that matter most to our kids are definitely our, our relationships and the way that they feel in our classes. And so one way to make that connection stronger is through making thinking visible or making learning visible, which is why I want to have you think about using Screencastify not only as a teacher to create some videos for your students to watch, but also for them to be able to create their own videos to share back with you to show you what they're thinking or feeling about a certain topic or a certain subject. And then Feedback is hugely important. So being able to even use a Screencastify to give feedback back to your student is also very valuable. So thank you for listening to a longer video than normal. And we are going to hop into Screencastify. So let me escape out of my full screen. Questions before I get started? Yes, Susie, there is one. Um, yep. I, I want to just record my voice while students look at a picture. Mm -hmm. I assume, then I assume post it on YouTube so my at-home learner can access it as well as the kids in school. Is this the tool I would use to do this? Sure, it could be. And let me use an example of that. Let's do, um, oh, let me do Google Maps. And I'm gonna pull up a map, which is the equivalent of a picture. So here we are, Mashpee's in front of me. And right now you can't see my face, but you can hear my voice. So if I wanted to have a discussion about them, it could be a historical map, it could be a political map, it could be a environmental map, it could be a picture of a horse, it could be whatever it is that you wanna have in front of the screen. It could be your Google slide presentation whatever it is that you want to be able to record on top of what the student is going to look at, you want to have that up and ready to go before you start your Screencastify. 
So Screencastify is an extension that's installed on Google Chrome. We pay for it as a district so that now you have more, um, more space to save or to be able to upload um, your finished recordings. And it works on Chrome on any device. I had some people say they didn't have a Chromebook and so they didn't know what to use on their regular device. Like right now I'm on a Mac. I could be on Chrome on a PC. They all will have, once you've signed into your school account, you have to make sure you're in your school account. But once you do, you'll see that there's this little tiny arrow up here near the top that when you float your mouse over it, it says Screencastify Screen Video Recorder. When you first use it, oh good, I'm glad that some of this is coming up right now because I haven't used it in quite a while. You have to set it up for the first time and it feels like you're clicking on endless buttons to get it up and running on your device for the first time. But it's, it's something that you have to do. So let's see, I wanna make sure that my microphone access is working. So I'm giving the permission to do it. If your students are having trouble, they might have clicked block at this step instead of allow. You wanna make sure you click allow, otherwise you can't record anything. And now I have to go back because it opened up a new new tab. I'm going to close that tab. I'm going to go back to my Google Maps. I'm going to go back and click on the arrow again. So now I know that the microphone is okay. I'm going to embed the webcam too. And it's going to have me select which one that is. And it should put my face up here in a minute. And then I can decide if I want to enable the drawing tools which is another way to be able to annotate over it. I'll click allow. Now I'm going back up to that arrow again. Oh, now I have my toolbar in the way, so I've got to move that. Move it. There we go. Click it again. Okay. So that's what I meant by it feels like you have to click on it and off it and on it and off it. I could do that I wanted to record a browser tab. If I do that, then it literally is only going to record this map. That's the tab that's open on my browser. So if during this recording, I decide to click on a link, maybe it's something on the map, or if I decide that I wanna show them something else, then it won't record it if it opens in another tab. It will only record on this tab. If I want the ability to jump around from tab to tab or even program to program, then I would choose desktop. And that's why that comes up as your first option anyway. So now it would allow me to jump from tab to tab or program to program. Or I can decide that I want it only to do my webcam, which would only show me, not the screen at all. And there might be times that you wanna do that. It's just a tool that you're able to use to record your face. So whether you're standing in front of it, in front of your device, or you're sitting in front of it, it would do just your face. So I'm gonna do desktop, but I've embedded my webcam. It's not required. I like to do it just because it reminds me that I'm talking to humans and hopefully reminds the humans that it was a human that did this. So I'm gonna hit record and it should count me down. So there's my face. I don't like it at the bottom. I keep looking down at it. So I'm going to move it to the top, probably towards the middle. And so there, so if you put your little face in the middle, instead of like, if I keep it at the Susie, bottom. Susie, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. We're not seeing your box okay. right now, like what you're showing us in Screencastify. We see the map, yep. but only the Zoom face bar. Okay. So, so you oops. Now it's counting you in. I think it did it now. All right. So now can you see my face? At the top? Yes, it's there now. Okay. So it must have just been that one setting that it wasn't showing you where you're able to um, hit the start button basically was the only thing that was on the screen and it's probably why it didn't show me show you my face but your face you can move around if you move it to the bottom of your screen and you ever look at yourself then that's what you're going to look like you're going to be looking down so i advise that you keep your little picture if you're going to use it in any of your things i'm having a hard time moving it there it goes 
um, I'd keep it up near your camera so that at least it looks like you're talking to students that are in front of you. So I'm recording right now, actually. I'm not making anything that's worth watching again. Um, there's a couple of different tools that are down here at the left-hand corner, and I'm gonna move that up too if I can, because, come on, it should move up. Um, I keep bumping into my, my apps at the bottom, but you have a pause button, which comes in handy. I have a horrible habit of hitting stop if someone walks in the room, but if I hit pause, I can pick right up where I left off and I don't have to start all over again. There's the mouse pointer, which I can use like a normal mouse to be able to show you stuff on the screen. Or if I want to be able to turn that into like a focus mouse so I can show you with a little bit more specificity. Well, that's a big word for a girl who had a stroke. Um, or you could hide the cursor when it's not moving. So if I don't move, then it should hide the cursor. You see the little black arrow disappear. Or I can have it, oops, highlight the clicks. So when I click on things, it should, you can see the little dot shows up when I click on stuff. Um, although it's putting little spots on the map right now. <laughs> um, let's see, the next one over is your pen. So you can choose from your rainbow of colors. I'll go with mash B blue. And then you can draw on whatever it is that you're doing. If you need to point to something that's important, if you need to you know, show something that they're gonna start here and then they're gonna make their way over to this activity, whatever it is, you can draw on the screen. And then you also have the eraser, which allows you to erase things. And then you could embed your webcam which I don't have one, um, but if I did, like right now I have the cam on my Mac, but if I also had a webcam connected, I could click this and it would switch to the other one if you have them both connected to the same device. And then I could hide, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna interrupt with a quick question to make sure that's the same thing. It says, if you have a separate camera or Elmo, can either of those be used to record your session? Yeah, they should work, yep. So that's what you were just yes and when I was setting up my um, recording because it's still recording now it did ask me which camera I wanted to use I only have one which said FaceTime camera so that's what I chose but if I had another camera attached to this device it would give me a choice of two cameras good question um, and then I could hide the tools. I don't like to do that because then I have a hard time finding them. And right now, the fact that I'm making a recording isn't really a big deal because I'm not trying to make a recording. But if I um, mess up, I want to be able to get to my tools easier. The, um, I can wipe my screen clear so that gets rid of all of my doodles. And then the way to actually stop recording, if I remember right, it's all the way up here in your screencastify. I'm gonna move my face. See the little screencastify thing? If you're near the top of the screen, it is the um, the stop button when you click on that. Come on, there you go. Then it, you're allowed to stop it. That takes a long time for me. Like I've recorded for four minutes already. Already I am a video that is too long. Um, what I would normally do is I would hit pause. So now I'm not recording at all. And then I would go up and I would hit stop. So I'm not at the end of my video going, oh, here's the stop button, because that's what I usually do and then cut it off at the end. But you're able to then hit the stop button up here and it will open up a new window. So what it's doing automatically is, is, is saving it to my Google Drive because that's where it stores them in a special folder called Screencastify. So after recording, your video will always open here, the video page. On this page, you can quickly polish your videos and share them with your audience. Um, I'm gonna do Show Me Around because the editing is something that we pay more for. That's part of this pro account. So you can trim your video so that it's not as long. You can cut unnecessary footage, like at the end, if I was all weird at the end, I could get rid of that. So I could take and drag these ends in, these little balls will bring it in and it will change the size of your video. 
You can also give it a title, which I often forgot to do when I use Screencastify. So being able to title it now is a good idea. So it makes it easier to stay organized and find it later. You can also grab the link now because just like YouTube, it's already creating the link. The video is not quite in there and not quite processed, but you already have that shareable link if you want to grab it now to be able to paste it into whatever classroom or what have you. Then you can also share your video directly to classroom or you could publish it to YouTube or get an embed code or right, there's more options there too. I'll click on them in a minute. Um, to take a second to talk about the difference between keeping it in Google Drive and putting it on YouTube. Essentially, there's really no different except for your drive will run out of space after some given time. You have quite a bit of space with a school account, but if you are creating something specific for maybe just one student and you can use the sharing at the top of your video, you can share it with just that one student. That's one way to use it, but you could still do that in YouTube. Um, YouTube makes it easier to organize everything, I believe. You can take your videos from Screencastify that are saved in Google Drive and move them into other folders. They don't have to live there forever. Uh, they don't have to be stuck there. So it's basically a matter of preference. I would be using YouTube just to free up space for the same thing when you create your recordings eventually for um, Zoom. I would put them to YouTube even if you then keep them um, recordings for Zoom that you want to be seen, not the ones that you're just keeping yourself in case you need them. But if you want them to be seen by others, I wouldn't keep them in Zoom, just like I take them out every day and I put them up onto YouTube. So there's no right way or wrong way when you decide if it's going to be YouTube or Drive, but just so you have an idea. I don't know if you can download it on a um, Chromebook, but if you're on another device, you'll have that option or you can have some other exports. You can export just the audio. Um, an animated GIF, I'd have to play with that because it's such a long video. That's not really a GIF anymore. It's a video, but it would be something to play with. Uh, make movie magic in the editor. Turn your screencast into polished videos by cropping, adding text, and merging clips in our super simple editor. So up here is where you can then open your video in editor and you'll be able to do some basic um, movie editing, which is a nice feature to be able to have. It's a nice feature for your students as well. So we're in here. I'll show you the editor. I probably should change the name. I was also going to look over here at more options. Oh, you could send it in an email or you could generate a QR code if you wanted a QR code for people to be able to access that video. Before we talk editing, the yep. uh, question is, can you change camera during taping? I, be I believe you can, yes. I should probably have one connected just so that I could test that. But yes, I believe that you can. When you're, ta when you're taping, I sound old, um, there's the video camera option down there, the document camera, that when you click on it, it switches to your doc cam. I imagine that when you click on it again, it would switch back to the regular cam, just like mine did, except for I didn't have the second cam to go to. Um, and one more question. If the little extension is not visible at the top, if you yep. have to click on your puzzle piece to see more, you can just reorder those by clicking and dragging it yep. more to the left, like yep. the ones you use the most. Yep, so I can take it and drag it to wherever I want it to go so that it's always available and seen in front of me. And then there's others that I can bury to the bottom because they're not as important. Good question. We good? Yep, we're good. All right. So then coming up here to the editor, like I said, this is part of the fact that we have a paid account. So it's going to bring me and my video into the editor. Hopefully it's not going to be too slow. I did start recording this session, right? Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Come on, little computer. This would probably be something you wouldn't be doing in front of students anyway. 
except for to maybe teach them how. All right. Welcome to the screencast of I edit or editor. So you can add videos to your project. You can import files from Drive or upload directly from your device. Any video will work, not just videos made with Screencastify Record. So that's pretty cool that you can put in other videos and you add them down here. And then you can make your edits in your timeline. So that's when you can like flop them around, put the first one last or the last one first or make them shorter. Um, that's where they'll go is down here in this timeline. And then you can also um, crop or zoom in or out on your on your um, videos if there's things that you want to be closer in on. You can add titles to them. That's all down here. The cutting, the cropping, the zooming, the, um, the text or trashing. And then when you're done, you download your finished video, which I believe another way is to get it up into Drive. Yep. You can put it directly to your computer or up to drive. And then once it gets, that's done, then you can put it to YouTube if you want to. And so now that I'm in here, um, one of the things that I'll do is select it. So this is the clip, it's already in here. You can see that it starts over here where the little six dots are like a domino. And if I scrub to the right and I'm scrolling, I can see the other end of it here. If it's too long, I can, change the view of it. So if I drag this big ball to the left, I believe it stretches it out. Am I lying? Wait a minute. Oh no, to the left is going to make it smaller. That's why it says minus and the plus will make it longer if you have to get into some really precision edits. That sometimes is why you want to look at it more closely. But for the purposes of this, I'm going to keep it all the way to the left. So this is what's called the scrubber bar. And that's what is currently playing. If I hit my space, like you're going to be looking down. So I advise, oh, am I loud? Um, when you hit the space bar, it will start to play wherever it is. But let's say that there was something that I wanted to be able to crop out. Let's say it's somewhere at the end here. That takes a long time like that. I'm going to click on the little scissors. Oops, did I just lose my selection? I did click on my scissors. And what it does is it crops it between the scrubber bar to the end and the scrubber bar to the beginning. So if I needed to take out a whole section, I could first click on it, make sure my scrubber bar is where I want it to go. It has to be yellow and in the right spot. There we go. Let's say that's the perfect spot. I would then hit the scissors and it breaks it apart. So let's say that middle section was, you know, I don't know, a fire drill or an interruption. Now that I have that middle section selected, I can delete it. So now my video, if I hit my space bar or hit play, I'll be able to get to my tools easier. The, um, I can wipe my screen clear so that gets rid of all of my doodles to stop it. And you see it goes right to the next clip. So obviously I'm cutting and pasting and getting rid of stuff in the wrong spots, but if you had a video that you actually were trying to work with, that's what you'd be doing. Um, let's select, we'll select this one here and then you have the crop. So if I needed to make it smaller, I believe that I'd be able to drag in on the sides, crop the clip, Susie, why is it not moving? Oh, draw a rectangle to crop the clip. That's why it's not doing it that way. So let's say we really want to just look at the fairgrounds in that last one and I click done. Go. Well, that's going to be spam on my telephone. So now when I hit my scrubber bar, did I hit done? I did hit done. It's not doing anything. Hello? It's not doing anything. It's ignoring me. If I hit reset, it's not doing anything. If I, I don't want to close out the whole thing. I can see it moving around in the background, but what it should do is show only this part. And you can almost see it in here that it's, oh no, you can't. But it should, when it plays that clip, it should show only the part that I've cropped out, except for now it's stuck. 
probably. I don't want to export it if I hit the undo. I don't, I'll try, oops, wait a minute. It just, oh no, it just undid my delete. So that won't work. All right, so that's another tool to try when the internet wants to work for me. And then the Zoom, hopefully it doesn't get stuck. Same idea, it's gonna allow you to zoom in. You can decide what it is that you want it to be able to show. You can play with that and then you're able to save it, add that clip. And then it should, oh no, that's to add another clip. Sorry, I'm clicking on the wrong stuff. You can tell that it took a long time. Just sent me off on the wrong direction and now I'm all flustered. Let me try this one more time. That and done. There we go. Phew. So now when I get to the end, get rid of all of my doodles to stop it. So that's cool. It, it allows you to crop out other stuff. So if there's stuff happening in the background or on the screen that you don't want them to see. And then you can also add text. I can write something, something. I can change the bold, underline, all of that stuff, the font, whatever it is that I want, how big it is, whether or not it's centered, whether or not it's centered up to, to top to bottom. And then I believe I can move it. Can I move it? Oh no, it's centered on the screen. So it's not as, not as wonderful as I would want it to be. I'd want it to be able to move exactly where I want it, but it's gonna work more like a Google Doc, either left, right, center, that type of thing. And then you can either put it at the top, middle or bottom top, and then middle, which I just had, or the bottom. But you can fuss with it and get it to show what you want it to show. And then if I wanted to add a clip, I could upload one from my device or I could go to Drive if I have one in there already and that could go in there as well. And then when I'm all done with this beautiful project, I can hit export and then I can export it to Google Drive. If I do it as an MP4, it will try and save it to your hard drive. If you're on a Chromebook, I don't know if it will let you or not. So awesome because of the space on it. So then you just put it up to Drive. So now it has made it's already giving me a link, but it still has to be processed. Susie, we have, um, oh, well, it's processing. Um, Karen Assad, looking at the Chrome extension list on the desktop, I don't have Screencastify. I've tried to search for it so I can download it, but it's not showing up, any suggestions? All right, I will look for it when we get offline so that I know that you have it. And that way we'll make sure you got it. And it's still processing. Any other questions? Teaching your students how to use this, I think is hugely important. If it's something that you need help with once the school year gets rolling and you have some semblance of normalcy, if you wanna have me come in as a guest teacher into Zoom or into the classroom or both, whatever works. I could create a um, tutorial that you could put up or I can come in and teach your students live in some way. Then I can show them how to use it. And don't count yourself out. If you are in the elementary schools, you'd be surprised at what kids are able to do. It takes a few tries for them to get the hang of it. But if the first few are not anything that's hugely important that you're like, oh, we lost those. Um, then it takes the pressure off too. So it might be good for like introductions or my favorite pet or whatever it is that, you know, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it would build community and allow them to practice a tool. You'll be surprised at what your little ones can do and you'll be amazed at what your older ones can do. All right, so finally it's done. I could go to view it and I believe it's going to bring me to drive. Oh, no, it's um, bringing me. Some Anne Marie oh. Finn go ahead. is, um, I'm using a different device. It says it is not whitelisted to add to my computer. Hmm. So another issue with finding the extension, I guess. Henry, if you'll do me a favor and send me an email and tell me what type of device you're on and you're in Chrome, right? Um, but that might help me to troubleshoot it, which I can do after this session too. 
Um, Susie, to go back to um, Mrs. York's question about wanting to show a picture but not her face, I believe when your camera's on, you can close out the little picture of you. All right. When you start so now record. can you see my face? Yes. yes. I didn't mean, that was me on the recording saying that. I want to close this out. So yes, when I am in the very beginning of creating a video, we go back, here I am on a Google map again, and I go up to Screencastify. Can you guys see that little box that just popped up at the top? Yes. All right, so you would shut off the embed web webcam, try and say that 10 times fast, and then it won't show the little picture of you. It will only hear you. Okay, I just wanted to make sure it was clear for her yep. question Absolutely. that she wanted her voice, but not her picture. Absolutely. Her, or yep. her video of her. She wants a picture, a still picture, I think. Yep. Okay, we're caught up with questions. Okay, good. So it's quarter of, let me, um, what was I gonna do? I was gonna stop my screen share. All right, any other questions? Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but um, I said in my email this morning that I have asked everybody, I only need 16, but I'm asking everybody if you have something that you've either tried to use or that you have used in the past, a tool that you like, a strategy that you've learned, uh, something your team has figured out. I've reached out to some of you, so I'm hoping that you'll answer my email and sign up for a time slot. But luckily I started today with a couple up my sleeve already. Um, so I'm going to share and I'm looking to see if that person is in here. Nope. Um, I'm going to share another one that I have that was shared with me so that we can kind of fill these 10 minutes that are in between the hour with basically I'm calling them like 10 minute. Um, what did I call them 10 minute. Ch -ch 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 -ch. I already forgot the name I gave it, but kind of like commercials for different things. And so you're not required obviously to stay for it because I will record them separately and still upload them, but there'll be quicker bites that you'll be able to learn about a new tool from your peers. And it's nice for you guys to learn from someone other than me. So any last questions about Screencastify? It just takes practice and feeling more comfortable as you go along. Nothing in the chat right now. All right. So let's see, I'm going to stop recording.